for this round. Does that work? It's, yeah, sure. That works. <laughs> All right. Anthony Nedlin, the Dominic Striker. One of them will be the pog champ this round. Maybe. And then we'll be corrected that we're not using the word right, which is okay too. All right. Naya Enchantress versus Mono Green Tron. We just saw Dominic Striker defeat, defeat George Shabur, uh, who had two Blood Moons in the sideboard. Anthony Nedlin has two Blood Moons main deck in his Enchantress deck. Oh. So uh, let's let's see what, what we can see. Dominic Striker leads off on a forest. Ooh. Not the best play for Tron. I mean, normally you would... I, okay, maybe this is like four or five years ago. You'd at least be in a situation where you're like, okay, I don't know if this is Mono Green Tron. But nowadays, the only players that are playing Ancient Stirrings are Mono Green Tron players. So you're almost certainly like, oh, this is good for me. <laughs> yeah, finds Ugin. Now, Ugin's going to be pretty good. It's just Enchantress if it ever resolves. It'd probably be about a 27 for one. So we'll see. Uh, this is the, this is what the players are Okay, Forest for Anthony Nedlin. So Forest on both sides. We have a... Uh, okay. Uh, abundant Growth. And Anthony Nedlin's cards will stick together, but he will manage to draw one off. And we are underway in round eight. I cannot express to you why that made me so stressed, but for some reason that really stressed me out to see. The drawing of that card there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it looked a little, yeah, it looked a little shaky. Like, I mean, when one sticks, then you're worried that like three or four are going to come off at the same time. And then great. I'm on camera playing for top eight and I'm going to accidentally draw five cards on turn one. Yeah. That would be, that would be quite bad as, oh, I should know this one. Sterling oh, that's Grove. A, that's a Sterling Grove. Uh, and yes, you should know all the cards I know for sure. So should everybody. And okay. Dominic I'm just Strider used to up, the old art of Sterling. I know. Grove. So am I. Dominic Strider picks up the <laughs> Gantha on turn three. So this means he's either got tower rolled up or his hand is just mush. You have either um, have tower rolled up or you have no way to find a tower rolled up and you're no, okay. We can see in the hand that there is a tower. There is a tower in hand. We know there's an Ugin. Here's a presence for Anthony Nedland. And Anthony Nedland is dead. I, I was um, just gonna say, yeah, we're gonna follow this up with an Ugin minus three, and this start that needed to happen for this enchantress deck is just gonna be very quickly dismantled. Yeah, I mean. Dominic being on the play here, um, there was no risk of, um, or it was unlikely Blood Moon making the play first anyway. It is possible. There are There is mana acceleration in the Enchantress deck, but here's actually Karn. So you know what Dominic's saying? <laughs> I don't even need the Ugin yet. You don't have enough stuff to bother with. All right. So I'll just Karn away. Uh... The forest with the abundant growth on it, that works. Oh, sure. Yeah, because the Sterling Grove will only give... Uh the enchantments themselves mm -hmm. so not even worrying about but i also says hey that forest is mine <laughs> uh we are unsure if these players will make top eight but their chances are certainly better if they win this match because we have some draws that are kind of on shaky ground the uh results from this round are going to shake up quite a few things yeah so i can tell you exactly what happened here we were going to feature table three Table three decided to draw, um, which I'm going to say is not safe for one of the players uh, from that table. Uh, they could still get in, but it is it is no, but it's not assured. So um, we had to switch the feature match. Uh, these players are trying to bump out one of those players, and I think it's certainly possible that they would. Anyway, that's sometimes in you know. Live tournament coverage, players do things that you don't expect. In this case, that happened on table three. So we are underway here on table six. The backup is table five. Uh, so one or both of the match winners this round will make top eight. Mm -hmm. uh, no way for us to know who that ends up being. Although it is at the moment not looking like Anthony Led Nedlin will be winning game one. And... All of a sudden, there's a saga in play. Sterling Grove going to get hit by a cityscape leveler, and a rough place to be for Anthony. But that Sterling Grove is still saving the presence of Enchantress's presence and this Sithis Harvest Hand. Which, I mean, if we're getting to untap with both of those in play, we could just draw a whole lot of cards on ne the next turn. I think Anthony's main concern has to just be restrictions on man. Uh, whoa. Okay, there's there's a blood moon. So this leveler uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't see it. Like the the blood moon could prevent the Ugin from coming down momentarily, but I don't know what's going to prevent the blood moon itself from getting blown up, um, or what's going to protect Anthony from getting attacked and just losing the damage from the cityscape of So it's looking uh, grim, I would say. I'd be inclined to agree. Starting off having this planes to play okay. on thin ice. On thin ice will take out the seascape leveler, probably. Yeah, I would imagine that would be the answer as well. But before we name a target, we're going to go ahead and resolve our cast triggers from both Sithis and Enchantress's presence and get rid of that. Uh, I imagine that there wasn't, yeah, there's no power stone because we sacrificed the uh, Sterling mm -hmm. Grove in response to be able to search up this blood moon. Okay. Um, that's that's good for Anthony. I mean, he made some headway, rebuilt a hand completely, but I mean, without the hexproof of Sterling Grove, this blood moon's just going to get picked off and then whenever Dominic wants, we can come kind of come down and clean up the rest and get back the <gasps> Seascape Leveler as well. Uh, unfortunately, the Cityscape Leveler isn't a May. We so do you're have suggesting to... Dominic would have killed one? Really? Oh, well, it's a cast trigger, so I guess we don't have to yeah. hit anything. Yeah, the ETBs, but I do believe that it is not a May trigger. It's Let me just, know. No, it's you're looking it's, at it. It's well, it's it's destroyed up to one. Oh, up thing. to one. So, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so I you, have destroyed my own things, but right, I never I mean, complained yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. You just so you, it's not a May, but it is. <laughs> but it is. But it is effectively optional. Yeah, because you can attack, one. blow up your own chromatic star, get a power stone for free, draw your card anyway, and then say poggers and, that's and win exactly the game. What right? I've done. Yes, exactly. Good job, right. Joe. We got it. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, Ugin does come down minus three. Uh, get rid of all the non lands on Anthony's say board. Goodbye. Create an 88. Dominic will read the card, realize there's no trigger there, no problem. And this a hard to see a, a board here. wipe in this enchantress deck, uh, like a. We need like a planar cleansing. A cataclysm? Yeah, something like that would be good. Um, there's not even a sorcery in the deck. So, no, no, I don't think we're going to see that. There is an Emerald the Ants Tarn, and that would be good. Oh. Uh, we're 11 mana short, shy of casting it right now. I was going to say, but that is still like a very old school way of trying to play this Enchantress deck. Mm hmm. Yeah, an unfortunate place to be if you are Anthony, though. A lot of your pieces have been quickly answered by a lot of two-for-ones on Dominic Stryker's side of the board. I mean, he's still at 20. At? It's tied. Oh, Joe, you and I have played enough Tron to know that life totals are not really a factor in this in this uh, matchup, in any matchup with Tron, really. I mean, sometimes your life total is something that matters, but your opponent's life totals don't usually ever matter. <laughs> I don't know. Anthony Nedlin's got this Sithis Harvest hand here. He's got a Posechu on the uh, Seascape Leveler, which is going to find Dominic a Forest. Uh, and then I guess he can unearth that if he wants to. Yeah, that that's a that hurts to target with Besaju. <laughs> this is this is all fine as long as Anthony is confident that he can win two games without the clock being a, a factor. If he uh, he does have a draw already in the tournament, both players do, and you don't you can't afford another one. So all power to him wanting to play this out for as long as he wants to. As long as the clock isn't going to be a factor, and yeah, all right, we've reached right. the point. Anthony says, you know what? Ooh. Let's just pack it up. We'll shuffle up. We'll see if we can find some help out of the sideboard. There is, in fact, another copy of Blood Moon there alongside some other tools. Rest in peace. No Sony Silence? Okay, that's possible. Yeah, there's also uh, 
kind of a fun new card in the form of Spark Rupture in the sideboard here, which is an enchantment that is going to allow you to stop Planeswalkers from being activated, which, considering the Planeswalkers were the problem in that game, something like this Spark Rupture might be something that Anthony would be interested in. Where, where did this... I've never seen this card before. Where did this It's happen? brand new. It's from Aftermath. Oh, okay. There you go. Brand All right. spanking new. Can we bring a card up on the screen during the side, during uh, this uh, phase of the broadcast? If we can, let's bring up Spark Rupture. Okay, well, we'll get to it later on then. But Spark Rupture, yeah. One, white, and two, as Becky said. It's a cantrip enchantment. And, oh, I, I, I read it wrong the first time. It's It wipes out all the Planeswalkers. Mm-hmm. Each wow. Walker, yeah. All the planeswalkers turn into creatures. Okay. Well, that would be something to see. On top of that, we've got things like ossification, which I think does a little bit more for this enchantress deck than on thin ice, because it's also going to be able to target those planeswalkers mm -hmm. and it doesn't just target creatures. So I imagine that's going to be a little bit of an upgrade for Anthony as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe never more. That could stop Ooh, one thing. Yeah. I'm not sure that's really valid, but uh, it could be. Anyway, let's go ahead and look again at Dominic Striker's Green Tron deck, which uh, is uh, really kind of packed with sweepers. Uh, Oblivion Stones, Ugans. These are bad cards for the Champions <laughs> of the base. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a... Uh... I mean, we're we're playing a very different version of Tron. Our experience with Tron at this point is quite different from this. However, I will say that Dominic Striker's version that is still playing things like Ugin the Spirit Dragon is a big upgrade in a matchup like this. Yeah, in the sense that Dominic Striker is likely looking to absolutely demolish this Enchantress deck. Uh, these Warping Whales could probably be cut. We know we talked about this before. This sideboard is mostly Wish. Uh, it's all mm -hmm. artifacts plus the Companion. But there are some things to keep boarded in, like the Haywire Mites, for example, keep it boarded in at least one of them. And these Warping Whales aren't going to do a, to a whole lot. I mean, I suppose uh, Sithis is a target that can be actually killed. So is Sanctum Weaver. And there's four of those. So you know what? I take it back. Maybe these uh, Warping Whales stay, stay in, although Dominic didn't see Sanctum Weaver. So even money on whether they do or not. Anyway, uh, that's where we're at. Uh, Hey, and then the those of you who have not seen some newer Aftermath cards can take a peek at Spark Rupture. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of wild. It's pretty neat, actually. Uh, so Ugin turns into just an 8-8 eight -eight instead? Uh, I mean, like, if you're still playing the On Thin Ices, an 8-8's eight a lot more easy to deal with than uh, Planeswalker, so... Well, anything's easier to deal with than the Ugin. <laughs> <laughs> which just true, comes true. into play and kills your whole board. Uh, regardless, I mean, you have Sterling Groves to make your things hexproof. It just doesn't even matter. All right, drawing opening hands. Anthony will be on the play this time around. And let's see if that's going to be enough breathing room for Anthony to set up kind of the pieces that need to start moving. And that's kind of the unfortunate place. Both of these decks are trying to assemble different pieces and kind of have them work cohesively together. Unfortunately for Anthony, all of those pieces are permanents, uh, mm. are non-land permanents. And so that makes it a little bit difficult to survive against how much non-land permanent hate exists in the Mono Green Tron deck. Yeah. All right, so Dominic leads in the forest again, which is a problem if you're hoping for turn three Karn. But if you're looking for turn four Ugin or a Living Stone, it's totally fine. Yeah, and this was the start that we saw Dominic Stryker have last game. Mm -hmm. and last time our Ancient Stories got us an Ugin that we didn't immediately slam down. But this time it's going to find us an expedition map, which maybe this bodes well for Anthony. Maybe this is going to be something that shows it'll take a little bit longer to find some of these pieces that are necessary for Dominic Stryker to do a lot of two or three for one -ing. Mm -hmm. All right, so Sterling Grove into play for Anthony as well as Poseidon is a land. Uh, now, Poseidon is not like the best thing ever against Tron, but it is useful. So the fact that it came down to tap for green mana... I may suggest Anthony's a little short of green, or maybe just had both Besaju's. Yeah, Tron Feast found off of that Sylvan Scrying. 
Actually, Bosichu's a one of in Anthony's deck, so that's the only one. So there's the mana situation cannot be too healthy over there. Ooh. Okay, there's a forest, so I guess I'm just wrong. Well, that forest could have been the drop return. Yeah. Sanctum Weaver going to be the follow up, so we're gonna potentially unlock quite a bit of mana going into the next turn as Sanctum Weaver allows you to tap it for mana equal to the number of enchantments you control. Yeah, yeah, a very cool card. Here's a mine for Dominic. And Sanctum Weaver is vulnerable to Warping Whale here, but otherwise, like you said, Anthony's going to kind of catapult forward in, in mana development. Also, the Sanctum Weaver can tap for any color, which does include red for Blood Moon. Yeah, I'm trying to just make sure that we amass a ton of mana on both sides of the board as we're both trying to play our respective Eldrazi's. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah, one of us is trying to play Emrakul, the other one is trying to play Ulamog. All right, so we are going to have, looks like an upkeep sacrifice of Sterling Grove, giving up the Hexproof for the rest of the Planeswalker. So actually, I guess Warping Will is not able to kill Sanctum Weaver because it was protected, uh, but no longer is. And here is the Blood Moon. Blood Moon and the ability to cast said Blood Moon enabled by the Sanctum Weaver. Oh no! Oh no! So I actually thought to myself, Never well, there's a Warping Well, now would be a good time. And there it is. Dominic Striker takes out the Sanctum Ouch. Weaver. Now Anthony Medlin drawing this Blood Moon. Can he even cast it? I would guess not. Uh, me but too. I could be wrong. <laughs> I think you would have been on the board already if you could do it. Maybe we just didn't have it in hand. Yeah, planes for turn, tabbing for three, Enchantress's presence is our consolation prize, and I would imagine if we had a fetch land or some way to get the stomping ground out of our deck, we would have just gone ahead and slammed it. Okay, well, map will find plant, but... Limited to five mana this turn for Dominic Striker. So Anthony's got another turn. But if Dominic, yeah, if Dominic's wise here and so far he seems to be on top of everything, now he's just going to be thinking, how do I set myself up the best in case you draw the man to play the Blood Moon next turn? Yeah, it's just going to go ahead, assemble five mana for this turn. Five mana isn't uh, allowing you to do a whole lot as yeah, far as the great. Tron deck is concerned, but we could go for something like uh, Karn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great creator. All right, so now let's see. Did both Haywire Mites get boarded in, or is one of them still on the sideboard? Let's see. I imagine if one is in the sideboard, it would be the selection here. Ooh, Stone Brain. Okay, okay, a choice that we can't play this turn. We did see Dominic Stryker in the match before against George Shabor go ahead and use Stone Brain to get rid of all the Blood Moons from mm -hmm. George's deck. So I have to imagine that Dominic is just not trying to mess with any amount of Blood Moons and is trying to make sure that those get taken oh! care of as easily as possible. But uh, Stone Brain doesn't wipe a Blood Moon off of the battlefield, so that might end up not working so well. As I imagine, Anthony is hoping to just start things off with maybe a Sterling Grove to keep said Blood Moon protected. Oh, ossification. Uh, okay, ossification works too. Now we'll take out the card, draw Anthony a card. So it didn't even have to sweat the draw off the presence, just has the stomping ground from the deck this turn. And you know, this doesn't mean it's over because these Tron decks, Tron decks can survive Blood Moon, but this is certainly the best thing Anthony could have done this turn. Yeah, now that we know that the stone brain has been the acquired piece from Dominic's board didn't grab something like the Haywire Might. I mean, I would be willing to believe that we brought both of them in. Yes, I agree. And so that's not why we would have, or that's why we would have not gotten them. But yeah, this Stone Brain potentially a little too late now as Sylvan Scrying is going to be the play. All right. Scrying for Bosechu. Now, 
no guarantee that'll be able to be fired off this turn. So Anthony will have uh, will have a turn to find a Sterling Grove or uh, another Blood Moon, I guess. Oh wow, another forest from hand. So I take that back. Okay. Another okay. two mana besage you. Oof. Interesting that comes out right now. So Dominic has something to do with the rest of the remaining mana from this tower. This yeah, turn. are we just trying to go ahead and play the stone brain? Mm, I guess. Not sure that nets us a whole lot playing it out this turn. Oh, it doesn't hurt, I suppose. But it does give Anthony an extra mana on his turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ooh. it's another map. Not a bad way to use up all the mana. Yeah, can be cracked right now if Dominic wants. I imagine we... Well, I guess we could just go ahead and play the Stone Brain. You're right. That's that's an option also. It does feel a little bit spooky to go ahead and set that down into place. I mean, I guess it's closed deck list, but I, I would imagine that if I saw this deck out in the wild, I would believe that there were stony silences in the deck. So I wouldn't love leaving an artifact on its lonesome on mm -hmm. my board. Sanctum Moving is a choice off of the map. And Anthony, now, the onus is really on his deck to come up with the goods this turn. Does have several land, does have the presence. Uh, there are two more Blood Moons in the deck. And, I mean, Dominic's on five mana now with one in hand, so even a Blood Moon here, five land, sorry, with uh, with one in hand at least. So even a, he's making, Dominic's making progress towards hard casting, the, you know, the heavy hitters. Here's... Greater Ormancy. I, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's Greater Ormancy, which I'm not a card I could read the text off the top of my head. So let's pop that up on the screen for the viewers at home. Another way to protect a potential blood moon. There is a stony silence. Okay. A couple cards drawn here for Anthony. Shroud, Shroud, Utopia Sprawl to follow it all up. Continue to draw some cards and protect it as long as something like the Ugin doesn't come down. Yeah. Ugin and Oblivion Stone are still uh, bad news. Well, I take that back. Livingstone, not anymore because of Stony Silence. Oh, true. So this Harvest Hand going to be the follow-up as well. And now we'll be drawn two cards every time we cast an enchantment. And considering we were able to continue to have all of our cards be one-for-ones there, Anthony might be in a really good place if we can kind of fade an Ugin this turn. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. There's two Ugins in the deck. Uh, I mean, there are other... Well, I guess Cityscape Leveler doesn't do too much right I now. I think I saw an Ugin in hand. Uh, there might be another Teal card, oh, but no. I'm pretty sure that it's an Ugin yeah, the Sanctum kind of... of Ugin. Ouch. Uh, all right, so Dominic will choose what to tutor for with Sanctum of Ugin, and Anthony will be sad because... Because we just spent this whole last turn... Yeah, I mean, that's what he could do. all these pieces. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know... Sometimes when you when you're when you when you feel like the bad news is incoming, you still do what you can, and yeah, he uh, seems to be in relatively good spirits. He he kind of knew this might happen, and yeah, he probably knows it's over at this point. Yeah, I mean, this enchantress deck likely is hoping to run into the other decks in the format right now that just don't really care about enchantments, like the most enchantment hate that exists in the format currently is people playing some amount of force of vigors in their sideboard mm -hmm. but i imagine this deck is functioning pretty heavily off of yeah. being able to win game number one and between the greater oriamancy and those uh sterling groves you're able to protect things quite heavily with this deck yeah boy this Ugin, it only has the minus three here so it's still able to sweep again next turn if somehow that was required in the meantime great creator is going to come back I mean, this is this is pretty cool. This this deck for Anthony Nedlin. This is way outside the meta game here, and managed to make it to five one one playing for top eight here. But looks like he's going to come up short to Dominic Striker. 
can with the uh, pop of that ossification as well. Karn, the great creator, is back. We'll play a land. We could go for some searching in our sideboard to see what we can follow up in our next turn with. But with four cards in hand, Dominic Striker likely not in a place where we need more pieces. But hey, it doesn't hurt to make sure that our opponent can't cast a Blood Moon against us. Yeah, that, uh, that some rain in hand seems pretty good use of the remaining four mana. Okay, Trinisphere will prevent a any sort of cascading string of plays from Anthony. And yeah, I mean, really, yeah, I guess Dominic, even if Blood Moon comes down at this point, if if, if the worst Anthony can do is play like Blood Moon and one other thing, the uh, the Planeswalker Force will just clean it up anyway. Uh, okay, chat mentioning that he played Sanctum this turn. Before that uh, second Urza's mine, so maybe we can have the table spotter confirm that whether the chat is correct or not. <clears throat> really wouldn't have any impact on the outcome at this point, but it is a shame yeah. to to see things like that happen. All right, here's leyline binding, uh, three mana paid. So actually, the transfer has no impact on the binding at all because it only has three anyway. Yep. Make sure Ugin doesn't stick around. The follow up here as well for the three mana is the Sanctum Weaver. Another land ending with. Two cards in hand for Anthony Nedland here. Hmm. Okay. Well. Yeah, this is even uh, me. Okay, so chat, just to keep you apprised. We got a response from the table, um, which didn't, doesn't exactly answer the question that was asked. So uh, apparently everything is okay and the match is over with and Dominic Stryker is going to pick it up. But uh, yeah, so Dominic Stryker, 6-1-1. One, and one. And looking uh, possible for top eight. Uh, not guaranteed, but uh, we'll have a, a realistic shot at it. Coming from table six here this round. You got some people to jump, but... There were there were three draws this round, so um, maybe maybe that will work out for him. In the meantime, okay, Tron Tron being Enchantress, um, that wasn't exactly on the predictions for you know round eight for the winning end, but okay. Uh, disappointing for Anthony Nedland. Like you were saying, there's probably any number of good matchups in the field. This is very clearly not one of them. Yeah, I if I was playing an Enchantress deck, uh, I would be. Honestly, kind of frustrated and surprised to even see Tron in the field right yeah. now. I would be like, this isn't what I played against in my leagues on Magic Online. What is happening right now? And then proceed to probably have this almost same exact thing happen to me. So a rough spot to be in for the Naya Enchantress deck. It's a very cool list. And once again, I think probably would be doing fine against a lot of other decks in the format right mm -hmm. now because of the level of protection that it has and kind of functioning on a very different axis. Yeah, I mean, you talked. We talked about the uh, needing bigger removal spells to deal with, like the Domain Zoo deck, for example, and this Enchantress deck having Ossification, Leyline Binding. That works fine. So I'm sure that Anthony would have been happy to play an important match against uh, a deck like that, a deck based on creatures, even sizable creatures like you know Murktide Region and Ragavan. They all fall to Ossification, no, you know, no problem. But. Uh, not so well suited for, for the Tron Menace. And we've got uh, Dominic Stryker sitting down for an interview here. So we'll find out uh, what he feels about his deck, what his prospects are, and, you know, some exciting stories from the day. Dominic, can you hear us? One second. Uh, I'm trying to be able to hear you all. Yeah. Okay. All right. While we get this sorted out. Uh, oh, I can hear you now. How y'all doing? Oh, uh, we're doing great. Doing? So, uh, Enchantress, Enchantress in the last round oh. of the tournament. 
Yes, yes, yes. Unexpected pairing, probably one you're kind of happy to see. Joe, I need to tell you, so I was just telling them, I've been seeing them play all day because they take a while to play Enchantress and just licking my lips, thinking about my O-Stones and my Ugins right. and everything else. Um, and I had a draw and I found out later that they did as well. And I've just been waiting for our pairing. So it happening now is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, and that played out probably pretty much the way you expected. Yes, and it helps a lot to have uh, Ugins in your deck. So I only had one yesterday, uh, and I'm glad I added the second one because they're different art, and I know that I only drew the second one every time. Really? Nice work on that yeah. one. Yeah, great choice at midnight last night. All right, big fan. What made you end up deciding to play, like you've now talked about changing up to be two Ugins. What are some other plays or changes to this deck that you feel are maybe interesting or different or unique to your deck? Sure. Uh, so uh, we made the decision uh, late last night. So I was actually going to play Jeskai Breach, and I didn't want to make that many decisions today. So I decided to play uh, Mono Green Tron instead. Uh, and one of the things is we, uh, on our MTG Goldfish, like we literally have it named Going Four Color Hunting. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of people on the, on the NRG series, including the people I drove up with and the people I talked to, are really good four color players. Uh, so I came to ruin their day. So. Uh, we made some like subtle changes, so we went from one Ugin up to two from what a lot of lists are playing. Mm -hmm. We put a Sundering Titan in the main, yeah, uh, yeah. as well as a second in the sideboard. Um, I've blown up a lot of mana bases today against Creativity, Four Color, uh, George Jabor Control. Like A lot of people have a lot of greedy mana bases, uh, and it swept them all away, which is mm -hmm. super helpful. Um, and then uh, I'm known locally for playing usually 61 cards in my main deck. And uh, the 61st card today was Stonebrain. Uh, there's just a lot of really hard matchups that have really, really helped to have an answer to in game one before we're on Karn the Great Creator plan. So we have the Stonebrain because the Rhinos matchup is abysmal. So having a way to be able to get Rhinos before they get me, uh, it's good to take Creativity, take Archon. Uh, I, I've named Indomitable Creativity today. We've taken Leyline Bindings from people when it's their only answer. Uh, when I played against Four Color, I believe we used it to take Besaju away from them, so they have no answers to what we're doing. Uh, and so it's just been phenomenal to have access to it. The like list we took from Head 2 in the sideboard and just moving one to the main made it so much easier to know that I just have some answers, some really bad matchups. Round 1 today, I sit down, and my opponent goes Plains, and I think Esper Sentinel. And I'm like, hey, they're playing Hammer. This isn't very good. But my hand has Stone Brain. And on turn three, we just take all the Hammers away from my Hammer's slow draw and just wait for the game to end. So it, it's been great. So we played some weirdos. We played the Stone Brain, a second Ugin, and a Sundering Titan. But they all pulled their weight unbelievably today. And the draw bracket was a lot of creativity, George sure. Jabor control, uh, and four color, and somehow Enchantress. But I'm glad they're there. Right, sure. OK, so. Um... I want to ask you a little bit about the uh, the cyborg construction because sure. there are there are some Tron decks, including the, the version that Becky and I have played. Um, we we kind of made room for half a dozen or so green cards. You went with all artifacts and companion plan. Is that something that you're confident in? Was it uh, up to the you know yesterday? Were you deciding do I want green cards or cyborg? Or are you like you set on on the way you had it built? You're talking about like if people are playing like Nature's Claim in the sideboard. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've been really, really enjoying playing the Haywire Mites. Uh, yeah. And if you look in the main deck, uh, the main deck has one of Urza Saga as well, yeah. uh, used for grinding against like control decks. A lot of times you can like play it on turn one and know on turn three it's going to find your map and complete Tron for you. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same way, I usually when I'm playing it's like uh, matchups where I want to have Haywire Mites, such as heavy leyline binding decks. Fable decks, anything where there's a card that I can't beat that is naturalizable by our big bug. Not only do I get to bring in two copies, but I also know that I have a third one in the form of Urza Saga that I can find with it, which would not be the case if you have Nature's Claim. Sure. All right, that's great to hear. And is there anyone that you want to give a like little bit of a shout out or a thanks to in helping you prepare for this tournament? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, there's my good friend, Kat Miller. We drove up here together. We drew in round three today, uh, which allowed me to be able to play in the draw bracket today, uh, which has been really fun because I think there's a lot of decks at the top tables like Rhinos and stuff that are really hard for me. 
but being in the draw bracket allowed me to play a lot of the stuff that we got to eat up on today. Um, definitely shout out to NRG, just the Nerd Rage series in general. I live and work 10 minutes south of there. I play there every Wednesday. Uh, hope for NRG store streams to come back soon. Those are always fun. Uh, I've been playing Creativity for a long time and playing that there. Uh, but like I said, we were going four color hunting this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. Thankfully, it worked out. Uh, and last shout out to Min Max Games. Uh, I worked there, managed there. Uh, I went out them. I wouldn't have the pretty cardboard that I do. Nice. Okay, so uh, looks like there's going to be kind of a tiebreaker battle a little bit for, for the end. But uh, we hope to see you in the top eight. Good luck, Dominic Stryker. Nice performance today. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. So one match down for top eight. Uh, we got one more to go uh, before we get things started. So we have our backup match from round eight. Let's uh, let's get that rolling if we have that available, and we'll see who will potentially be joining um, Dominic in the top eight. All right, these are definitely the wrong names. So we'll see if we get that fixed. I believe we are watching uh, Taylor Kaiser and Darren Emerson. So uh, these players are the matchup are it's is it Murktide versus Living End is what we've got for you for oh. the second feature here. So some of the more more traditional modern decks than what we saw on camera in the first half of this round. You want to call Tron a traditional modern deck? I mean, not so much anymore. Uh, that's fair. I don't know that I would say that about uh, Living End either, though. Um. Uh. I think Living End is certainly an energy series, I mean, at least, if not everywhere else. But uh, Zoe Reardon put up enough finishes at this point since the last year or so that uh, I think Living End is, a, is pretty accepted as something you can expect to see. That's fair. Merktide, though, something you can see anywhere possible. And... All right. Chat corrects me and says, you're right. Living End is not very popular anymore. So, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, as we get underway here, no presence right, on the board who, yet. Who are we for... targeting with this bobble here? I feel like we pointed at ourselves, trying to make sure that that's going in the correct direction here for this Merktide player. Let me get no bird presence on turn two. That's a given. Uh, for Merktide, <laughs> uh, it's a little disappointing. I mean, there are certainly a number of creatures that can be deployed first couple turns of the game and we're not seeing in fact all of them except for the murktide region itself so taylor yeah. kaiser just uh just setting up maybe seeing on counter magic for the big turn but uh I, yeah, I would have to imagine that that's the case especially if you're not playing something like an expressive iteration or you're just like waiting to play some considers and just trying to kind of fix your draws out but that does feel like an awkward place to be for this murktide player Oh, and didn't even play another. What is in your hand? You're not playing a creature. You're always oh, your hand all lightning bolts and unholy heats. I think I saw at least one of each of those cards, but yeah, I'm still well, surprised that we don't even have a land drop to make. Oh, I think there's a land. I, I, are we sure? I'm not. Do, do we not certain that Darren might have just come first? No, but he literally just drew a card and then passed. Hmm. I feel like there's an island in Taylor's hand on the top. Yeah, there's definitely an island in the hand. Okay. Oh, maybe, it could oh, come off the, it, the bobble. It came off the bobble. That, uh, that would be possible. Sure. Okay, okay that makes okay. sense. We're piecing it together. I'm too slow on the. I update, feel like I yeah. normally have a better view of what's in players' hands than I do on this day and. A little bit difficult to tell exactly what's going on in there but living end for darren and we're gonna get some things onto this battlefield and start rumbling yeah i say counterspell takes down see how i, I threw in the, the set there because i know that one <laughs> okay all right so uh taylor will now be able to uh make a third land drop on turn four here with raggy man in hand But Ragman not worth as much as the opponent has Charlotte's agent already there. True. Ooh, grief from hand, pitching the architects of will. 
take a look at that hand that is so puzzling. So these players both six and one. So the winner here is guaranteed in, and in fact, will likely be a very high seed. Mm -hmm. As some of the tables above drew, here's another counter spell for the grief. So now, if there's a rule spell for the Shardless Agent, Taylor can get to work. That's a show of strength. Hmm. Shardless Agent attacks into Ragavan. Yeah, he got another one. It's okay. Yeah. And we already know that the Oof. counter spell got used this turn. So we yeah. know that we should be safe. Yeah, deep breath there for Tyler Kaiser because this, uh, this didn't work the way it was supposed to. I mean, it's hard. You almost always are going to counterspell something like the grief. Right. The you know, of course. And it's, I mean, if the grief, if you don't counterspell the grief, it takes your counterspell anyway. So, yeah, you, you don't really, there's not really an avoidable way to get out of that if the cards line up. And, well, Speaking of lining up cards. Yeah. That's uh that's a board presence. And <laughs> even a decent sized Merc Tide isn't gonna stand up to that. And Taylor uh Taylor realizes this. he's like, okay, well <laughs> let's try again. Yeah, I mean, I think this is just like a place where we're so used to seeing some of these early creatures coming out for the Is it Merc Tide deck that kind of fix your draws and make sure that you're not just sitting there, for a lack of a better term, playing open-handed, because there's only so many plays that you can make if you're not dropping one of these creatures or you're not using something like these considers. Like, it, it became pretty obvious what was in Taylor's hand, and the Living mm -hmm. End player just got to play pretty into what we could assume was in Taylor's hand. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. All right, so looking at deck this year for Taylor Kaiser down a game. But uh, these Murktai decks come prepared for all sorts of interactions. What do we have here? We have Counterspell's main deck, obviously. A couple Spell Pierce, one Charm. And the sideboard, okay, two Fluster Storms. That works. Uh, one Surgical Extraction. So you bring in Surgical, right? But then you, you obviously hope to hit the Living End after you counter the first one. But if you have to hit a creature... It's going to come back from a living end preemptively. Well, maybe that's what you do it, but you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. And looking over at the living end deck list in the hands of Darren Emerson. Well, looked pretty, uh, pretty solid game one. Uh, anything stand out to you that you, that you like or don't like out of the board? What are you looking for? It's hard. I feel like you're used to seeing things like, the mystical disputes for sure and then i've seen some people debate on if the subtlety is going to be right because you're just trying to make sure that things go and play at a slower pace and kind of gum up your opponent's hand so i think it'll be an interesting place to see how darren is going to approach this but the living end deck is certainly one that i am less familiar with what their game plan would be compared to the is it merc tide deck subtlety is such an interesting card because i feel like there are so many times where I've played myself or watched, and it's like, okay, well, subtlety, like that's not that great here. And then they pour it, they they play it anyway, and it ends up being great. Yeah, I, and, I feel almost the exact <laughs> same way. Every time I've had to play against it, I'm like, wow, this card is really impressive. And then I read it like on my lonesome, and I'm like, mm, I'm not really a big fan of this card. Yeah. All right. So uh let's go ahead and roll game number two and see uh See if can Darren, Darren can wrap up a top eight berth here or if Taylor will send it to a game three. Checking out these starting hands. Looks like Darren has gone down to six. Puts one back on the bottom, but is on that draw. So we should be a little bit more safe as we start off with a shock for Taylor here. And is it going to be a monkey? No, no monkey. Just holding up bolt slash heat slash consider. And it is grief again. There's a fluster storm in Taylor's hand. That's uh, why we're probably gonna see all of it. There's no way this grief's getting stopped. Two counter spells. Lots this time we've got an expressive iteration at least. Yeah, lots of counter magic, no aggression. Oh, uh, this feels hopeful. This, well, I guess maybe. Taylor's like, you know what? My life total isn't going to matter. If I'm going to lose, it's going to be by a huge life point swing anyway. So I might as well shock it in on the off chance that I get to use something like the dispute or the fluster storm. 
but having that expressive iteration taken away from you kind of feels like a beat. Yeah, sort of. Although, I mean, I don't know that you're real happy to play it on turn three anyway, if you haven't gone to the land before then, but we'll see. I mean, I mean yeah, I guess the counter magic is pretty redundant at this point. Taylor has so much of it. If Darren, to any one counter Darren takes, it doesn't change what Taylor's options are. Yeah. I don't know. It feels like it could be a game where Darren just now has to like sit and wait, but it's also hard because sitting and waiting is exactly what the Isn't Murktide deck wants you to think you can do. Mm -hmm. And then it's just going to protect something like a giant Murktide. Yeah. All right. So third land drawn for Taylor. That's nice. That allows him to uh, deploy multiple counters in a turn as that Flush of Storm plus a counter spell is going to hold off basically anything Darren could hope to do in one in one shot. So it's going to have to be volume of threats here for Darren because any the first, I mean, there's no amount of griefs so that's going to break through all the counters in Taylor's hand. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take a take a moment or two. Oh, the war going to be a land for a turn. I mean, this could be a place where Darren's hoping to like violent outburst or use something on end step and then mm -hmm. go into his turn. Yeah with a little bit more shields down. No, certainly that is the way you would like to see it go. Here's a ragged man. Okay, so, I mean, you're right. Outburst here followed by something on main phase would get it through. There's uh, no real way that, that Taylor can just kind of let one living in through and then survive the, you know, the fallout from that. There's too much in this in the graveyard already. Right, what are we starting with? Can start with the fluster storm targeting the living end. It'll be more than enough because of the violent outburst mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I like that because if Taylor plays the counter spell, well, Darren knows that Taylor's tapped out now. I mean, he hasn't maybe Taylor drew another fluster storm. He doesn't know. Or spell pierce or or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. All right. Take number two, a shardless agent. Taylor says, all right, let's go. Only two cards down is the living end. And yeah, those living ends were hiding out near the top. And is this one going to go through? It is. Yeah, and this is bad news for Taylor Kaiser. Darren is getting Shouldn't things have cast the monkey. Exactly as he wants it. You're right, the Rack Man is going to get wiped out once again. <laughs> this monkey has doomed us. Yeah, this is uh okay. Turn four casually, what three, six, eight, eleven, sixteen, nineteen damage on the board. I yeah. Think. That's yeah. that's uh Taylor's looking this over like, yeah, can Ragman stand up to this? Well, actually Ragman's not even well, survive this. shouldn't even be on the board. I yet. know. Uh Ragman... they're just sitting there, like, you know, take your time, survey the board. Yeah, yeah. I, you can, I'm, look, I'm at, you can look at all my creatures. That's okay. Yeah. You can spend as long as you want on this. This uh, this match doesn't take taking very long. You can look at this for five minutes if you want to, just as long as in the end I go to the top yeah. eight. Hold up. I'm going to check really fast to see if Taylor Kaiser's deck is playing Blasphemous Act. Um, <laughs> it's not. All right. Grief trigger. Yeah, let's see. Uh, these counter spells, uh, you can keep those now. Uh, I'll go ahead and take care of uh, the Murktide. Let me look at the top of your deck. Might as well. He's got two of those architects, so you can look at both sides. Even though Taylor, can, I'm sure, will fetch and restack his side. And, but with one Unholy Heat um, that can't kill the base creature on the board anyway. Mm-hmm. It's tough. I mean, you, you battle through all day long. You're six and one. You're playing for top eight. You're probably hoping you can draw as you go into the to the last round of the Swiss. Yeah. Find out you can, sit down to play, and then Darren Emerson and Living End show up and just absolutely smash you. I mean, because that's just what happened here. And there's no shame in that. That's just what happened. Taylor Kaiser yeah. today is not going to end well for you. Sorry. 
And that's such a like difficult place to end up in because from your point of view, you also are like, okay, my opponent knows what's in my hand. My opponent is going to try and play around the counter spells. So maybe I'm just going to try and start to make a different game plan out of this. Mm -hmm. And the moment that you try to make that little segue from what the deck has given you, it all starts to fall apart. Yeah. All right. So that will be the end of that. Darren Emerson will advance to seven and one. We will see him on the other side of the break. In the meantime, we'll run through a couple of things. We've got uh, top eight uncoming, upcoming uh, this evening, but we want to let you know about um, upcoming Nerd Rage events. If you're in the region, if you're in the Midwest, if you're traveling to the Midwest, or if you're just filling in your calendar for events you might want to watch on coverage, we've got June 24th and 25th, uh, Modern 10K Legacy 5K. That's in Mundelein, Illinois. And we've got July, we got St. Louis, uh, July 8th and 9th, uh, Team 10K on Saturday, Legacy 5K. The winners of all the Saturday events, including all three players of the winning team event for uh, July, do earn direct invites to the championship at the end of the year. And then August, to complete the summer schedule, Detroit, August 12th and 13th, Modern 10K, Pioneer 5K. So, yeah, show up and play, or... Uh, if you're just sitting at home and want to see some of the coverage, hit the follow button to be notified when we go live in the future. Uh, let's see, what else should we, should we hit? Uh, in addition to, we have the prize pool here. Oh, this yeah. is what's on the line today in the 5K. Uh, you can see 1,200 for first, 30 in your rate series points, and a regional championship invite for Atlanta. Which we found out is in December. Yes. And uh, you can see, and also, even if you uh, if you can't make the main events, if your um, your weekend activities include obligations in the morning, there are uh, RCQs running in addition to the showdown and trial during the during the weekends. Up to nine RC invites can be given away during uh, each weekend, depending on attendance. And in fact, I heard there was a player who went 03 in the showdown yesterday, and then entered. And went five and zero in the uh, RCQ and qualified yesterday. So congratulations to them. That's a that's a nice turnaround. Oh yeah, that makes your day all of a sudden feel a whole lot better. Yes, it does. And that is kind of the point of having these uh, these side events. You can get into in the meantime. Here is the ad for the showdown. For I'm sorry for the championship. Raja Suleiman is already qualified. Uh, this is an older graphic because Stephen Dykeman is also already qualified, so he should be on there from winning the March. A trial and there you can see him on top of the leaderboard this was updated after yesterday's event and you can see he has a gigantic lead but we're looking at what well, you should be looking at if you're considering coming out for events are the top i believe six names that are not or that are in white those are the players that would pick up the at-large invitations at the moment now clearly this is only the second weekend of the year from the rage events with i believe four or five more to go so this will change quite a bit and if you're not even on here yet uh, if you just move to the Midwest and you're thinking, okay, I may want to get started. Is it too late? It is not. So uh, that's what's on tap for the rest of the year and what's going on. Anyway, thanks for being with us. We're going to take a break. And Becky and I will be back with Top 8 Bracket in a few minutes.